So good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Doug Rice. And this is the second in a series of webinars produced by the Hospitality and Travel Special Interest Group of the Decentralized Identity Foundation. The first webinar was presented by Nick Price on August 11th. If you have not yet seen that and you're not already familiar with self-sovereign identity and decentralized digital IDs, I would recommend that you watch the recording of that. You may want to watch it first and then come back to this one. Uh, and I'll ask Mark Haley to post the link to the first one in the chat so that you can uh, you can see that at your leisure. Uh, we'll get the recording to this one posted in a day or two. Uh, we have a YouTube channel uh, and we'll post the link on the listserv. I'll also post it on my own uh, LinkedIn feed. Today, the travel industry and particularly the lodging sector is dominated by intermediaries. We have brands like Marriott, Hilton, Accor, and even Airbnb that amass thousands of independently owned accommodations across shared marketing and loyalty services. We have online travel agents that offer one-stop shopping for travelers. We have GDSs to consolidate supply for travel agents. And some of the GDSs like Amadeus and Saber also provide technologies uh, to airlines and hotels. Self-sovereign identity and decentralized digital identifiers create the opportunity for peer-to-peer -peer digital relationships between customers and travel providers. I wanna stress that what we will talk about today is aspirational. We will look at the possibilities presented by these new technologies and imagine how they could change the way we travel. This doesn't exist today as a full solution and is not going to magically appear tomorrow. While pieces exist now, it may take three, five, or 10 years to get to what we describe. But I like to think of this as a roadmap that travel providers, technology companies, and intermediaries can use to guide their future strategies and investments. You can certainly embark on a road trip without a roadmap, but you may not end up where you hoped, and you will probably not follow exactly the route you planned when you set out. But having a plan makes it more likely that you'll eventually get to where you want to go. And that's what we hope to present with these use cases today. In considering the potential of, of self-sovereign identity and digital decentralized ID, we identified about 20 potential use cases, and then we grouped them into four categories, and we started work on researching and documenting them. The four categories were first verified credentials and offers, which is enabling a customer, a customer to prove who they are to say what they want and to request and receive offers from travel providers on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. Second one was KYC, which is know your customer, profile and loyalty, which is enabling a customer to maintain a single rich description of themselves that can be shared selectively with travel providers. The third was travel change and disruption, which is enabling rapid synchronous or asynchronous communication between a traveler and travel providers whenever the elements of the trip change or are disrupted. The fourth is government sanctioned credentials, which is enabling travelers to present digital credentials that are issued or sanctioned by governments, such as digital IDs, passports, or health credentials. In this case, the use cases may all be developed elsewhere rather than by the travel industry, but we do expect to help with adaptation and adoption. There are two purposes, purposes for these use cases. The first is to get travel providers and their technology providers excited about what SSI and DDID can do for them. The second is to make sure that the developers of the standards, that's the DIFF working groups, understand what we need them to do with the standards. Each use case document has a number of sections. Some address both purposes, others just one. And we've kind of just grouped them here to in indicate the different purposes, but we're gonna go through these use cases in more detail. Uh, so you'll see that I think uh, as we proceed. As an overview, and just to give you a sense, I'm going to show you a few quick snippets of the first use case we published. You can find the full use cases using the links that Mark is going to post in the chat. Uh, we developed a template that covers both objectives. Some sections are designed mostly to get the travel industry excited by showing what the pain points are that could be addressed. 
and these are written in plain English. Other sections translate the use case to some of the technical constructs used by the diff architecture, and these do get a, a bit more technical. We try to cover some of the barriers to adoption as well, and also enablers that could speed adoption, because there will often be several of both. In the use cases, we show pictorially how the typical process works today and how it could change with SSI and DDID. We'll review this in more detail, but the interesting thing about this and many of our other use cases is that it enables commerce to be easily conducted without intermediaries. I'll now ask Mark Haley to give a one slide overview of the first KYC profile loyalty use case then I'll do the same for the first one from the Verified Credentials and Offers team. And then we'll do about 15 minute presentations on each with time for questions after each one. You're welcome to post questions in the chat uh, or ask the questions verbally when we get to the question section. So Mark. Thank you, Doug. Really appreciate uh, that great uh, overview of uh, <clears throat> the work that's been done so far and uh, what we're going to be doing today. Uh, just to clarify, in case it's needed, KYC means know your customer. It's not only a wise practice, but actually required by law in many jurisdictions, especially for banking and finance providers, not so much for uh, travel and hospitality providers. And this work group focused on the things that describe and make an individual unique. In addition to what we might describe as core elements like name and email address or physical address, for hospitality and travel includes things like room preferences in a hotel or suite or seat preferences for an airline. As shown in the Venn diagram in the slide, there's a lot of overlap with the verifiable credentials and offers group and their focus and identifiers, claims that can be verified and offers. All of this is uh, transacted securely in a zero trust environment using peer to peer transactions. As noted, the work groups developed an initial inventory of 20 some potential use cases to document. Today, we will discuss what I would describe as a universal one, the ability to share profile elements on demand with travel suppliers and other people that you do business with. Our example profile elements will be physical address and room preference, one shared globally with many providers, one shared specifically with a single hospitality and travel provider. Doug, back to you, please outline the uh, VCNO use case. Sure, uh, thanks Mark. And you know, like the KYC profiles and loyalty team, our team works with the customer profile, but we focus on the bits at the bottom, which are called verifiable credentials. A verifiable credential, or also known as a VC, is something about yourself that has been issued to you by a third party that others trust. You can present it to anybody you like, and they can immediately determine that it was in fact issued by someone they trust without actually contacting that, uh, that entity. Your profile contains lots of other information like your email, your phone number, your address. In most cases, you don't need a third party to prove those things. If I tell you my email is doug at company.com, you'll probably accept that in most cases. A credit card credential could be issued by a bank um, to say that it will honor charges based on presenta presentation of the credential. A merchant who trusts banks or an association like Visa could use this to ensure payment without ever touching a credit card. A college diploma or professional certification would be issued by the university or certifying body. A passport or other identity document uh, would, uh, would be issued by a, a government entity. Um, We have also defined a VC that we call a travel offer. This could be issued by a hotel or airline or OTA in response to a request for a quotation. It could be presented back to the provider to confirm the offer, at which point you might get a reservation verified credential. A key aspect of verify, verifiable credentials is that you can present verifiable claims based on the credentials. You don't have to provide the full credential if it's not needed. You could prove that you meet an age requirement, for example, by presenting a verifiable claim based on your passport. The claim proves you meet the age requirement without having disclosed your birth date or your actual age. 
Another key aspect of verifiable credentials is that it reduces the need for travel providers to store personal information. I don't need to store your credit card details if I can just request a credit card verifiable credential every time you make a reservation. And that concludes our overview. Um, so I will uh, turn it back over to Mark to take you on a deeper dive into the profile use case. Thank you, Doug. Okay, uh, so uh, the subject of our use case uh, today is Bob. Probably the most important thing that I want you to take away from this slide <clears throat> is that uh, when we see uh, Bob again in the next use case, my Bob is much younger and better looking than Doug's Bob. So remember that, please. <clears throat> Seriously, uh, Bob lives in uh, suburban Chicago and uh, as an empty nester, empty nester, he and his wife are uh, moving to a lakefront condo. Uh, he's an active traveler, a member of five airline loyalty programs and seven hotel programs. I'm not sure where loyalty fits in with so many memberships, but uh, that probably describes most of us. And he's actually elite in several of them. In addition to his uh, travel and hospitality memberships, he subscribes to two newspapers and the Bacon of the Month Club. He and his wife also have numerous healthcare, banking, and insurance relationships. <clears throat> All of these people that uh, Bob and his family do business with need to know about the move. What is Bob to do about it? <clears throat> now, earlier I described this as a uh, universal uh, use case, uh, universal that applies not only to the hospitality <clears throat> uh, uh, and travel providers, but also to banking, finance, healthcare, insurers, and virtually anybody else. If you've ever moved, you know that it took someone a great deal of time, effort, and inconvenience to deal with all the address changes. National change of address doesn't address everything, may or may not be timely, and it's not a service that's available everywhere. In this case, we document how de decentralized digital identity and self-sovereign identity concepts can simplify and streamline the change of address notification for both Bob and his uh, uh, trading partners. So in the old way, shown on the uh, left side of the screen, Bob had to reach out to each of his trading partners individually by whatever medium was at hand, that could be mail, telephone, fax, website, whatever it is, and provide his account number so they could find him, his old address and his new address. I mean. Let's face it, just looking up the account numbers is an ordeal. However, <clears throat> on the right-hand side, under decentralized digital ID and self-sovereign identity, he simply tells his uh, user agent to notify his trading partners, and it is done in what for him is a single transaction. Now, unfortunately, that doesn't cover everybody. If you recall from the previous slide, <clears throat> Bob subscribes to the Bacon of the Month Club. The club is a tiny little operation that <clears throat> is not yet SSI capable. So for that one outlier, Bob did have to pick up the phone and call just to make sure that he didn't miss a single delivery of uh, uh, gourmet bacon. When you read the full formal use case document, you'll see that the old way versus the SSI way is mapped out with arrows and flows, similar to the graphic shown earlier. But this depiction is intended to show the stark difference in simplicity and elegance that SSI brings to all partners involved. If we could move to the next slide, please, Doug. Okay, <clears throat> but we're not done with Bob yet. Uh, <clears throat> there's a second part to the use case. Right after the move, Bob and his spouse are going to Florida for a little vacation break and staying in a large waterfront hotel. But during the move, a mover drops a big box of books on Bob's big toe and breaks the bloody booger. I had to practice saying that. So anyway, <clears throat> Bob's concerned about the vacation. He recalls that the hotel that they're staying in has very, very long corridors. Visualize, say, the Weston Diplomat Hotel in Hollywood, Florida. Bob further remembers that one of his room preferences with Marriott International's Bonvoy Loyalty Program is away from elevator. This could be quite a long walk on a broken toe, and Bob just has far too much male pride to request a wheelchair. It's kind of a macho thing. So rather than dent his ego, Bob decides that he will change his room preferences just with Marriott to near elevator, and that will solve his problem for this trip at least. Again, it's a single peer-to-peer -peer secure transaction and Bob doesn't have to think about it anymore, at least until it is time to change his room preference and Bond Boy back to away from elevator or simply AE for those of us who were doing this back in the days of two character codes for everything. Okay, so why is this important? What makes it uh, relevant? First off, if uh, you've moved in uh, recent memory, you know how much of a headache it is uh, uh, to get the change of addresses uh, uh, done. 
And in hospitality and travel in particular, <clears throat> these profiles are uh, usually in many, many places, silos of uh, uh, data in different uh, uh, loyalty programs, and it becomes difficult to maintain accurate and current information. <clears throat> and uh, one of the bullets uh, that I want to point out here, if it's difficult to maintain, it means that it's not maintained. <clears throat> this data is often inaccurate or out of date. Uh, uh, SSI or decentralized digital ID, whatever label you want to use uh, uh, with it, simplifies the communication of accurate, current, and curated profile uh, uh, data. Okay. Uh, um, now, if you think back to uh, uh, Latin that you may or may not have uh, studied in high school, you want to know who benefits and how do they benefit from it. And again, this is not solely a hospitality and travel use case. It's a universal one that applies to banking, finance, insurance, and uh, uh, really the, all other uh, potential transactions. The consumer benefits uh, from the self and the sovereign part of SSI. It puts the consumer at the center of uh, uh, every transaction. It's controlled uh, uh, by the consumer. These are permissioned uh, uh, communications and the permissions are controlled by the consumer very much how the consumer benefits there. But the provider benefits also. They can do a better job. <clears throat> when Bob's staying at the Western Diplomat, he can uh, get a room near the elevator instead of away from the elevator. <clears throat> this is a level of personalized service delivery that hotels and uh, uh, maybe even airlines uh, certainly strive for. The profile information is always current because you go out and get it when you need it. And it enables the uh, uh, merchant to uh, reduce how much personal, personally identifiable information is stored. <clears throat> we can uh, drop down to what uh, uh, we've come to term the skinny profile, where it's a bare minimum, and then you go out and get the richer profile information when you need it. This has the uh, added benefit of reducing the risk of complying with uh, PII uh, stores and regulations like uh, GDPR and uh, PCI. Okay, now... <clears throat> In order for this use case to be realized, we have to make certain assumptions. Uh, <clears throat> certainly both the consumer, Bob, and the providers, uh, Marriott and the people that uh, he's changing his address uh, is with, have to have <clears throat> uh, decentral uh, decentralized digital IDs and identity hubs. And uh, if you're new to these concepts, you will want to uh, go back and uh, see the recording of uh, webinar number one from August 11th, where Nick provides an overview and a vocabulary of uh, uh, these concepts that'll uh, uh, help make this uh, uh, work uh, out. So the providers have to incorporate these technologies into their systems and consumers have to have a user agent supporting SSI and think of the user agent as simply a uh, uh, digital wallet on your cell phone to just uh, have something that's very concrete, simple to visualize. <clears throat> the assumption here is that these are peer-to-peer -peer transactions between the consumer and the provider. It's secure and uh, uh, it's uh, managed on a permission basis by the consumer. And uh, <clears throat> the other assumption that uh, is worth pointing out here is uh, it requires the, the schema for profile data needs to be agreed upon. Uh, how this data is stored and accessed needs to be understood and generally accepted. The next avenue for uh, this work group is to identify profile elements that will support each of the use cases documented or to be documented and maintain that as sort of a living document uh, that will over multiple iterations become a foundational schema. We're not going to try to boil the ocean uh, uh, at once and uh, come out of the gate with a fully uh, fleshed out profile, but we'll evolve one and uh, provide a foundation for the uh, industry to further evolve one. We do believe that the profile schema needs to be extensible so that new elements can be defined as needed for specific situations. Let's talk about uh, SSI adoption briefly. Uh, for any of this to work, a critical mass of consumers and providers, not just in hospitality and travel, must embrace and adopt decentralized digital ID and SSI concepts and technologies. These tools are trickling into the market as we speak. For example, Microsoft has just released a prototype of their identity hub, for example. It's not complete, it's not fully fleshed, but it is a, a, a prototype and it is available to uh, developers in the marketplace. No one knows what Apple is doing in this arena. And we will not know until they decide to tell us, but they do have a broadly deployed uh, digital wallet today an obvious precursor to the user agent as defined in the uh, diff lexicon. And who knows where Google is uh, with this, but uh, you know that they've got an army of people working on it as well. But I think the interesting thing about adoption that we've been learning and uh, working through these use cases 
is that once the decentralized digital identity platform is in place in an enterprise or on your phone, doing any one of these things actually becomes pretty easy, but we have to get the building blocks built and available. So <clears throat> at this point, I'd like to open things up to uh, any questions. Uh, please uh, use the chat or if you wanna come off of uh, uh, mute, uh, do so and just uh, introduce yourself. Questions, folks? Guys, you're being too kind. Come on, Doug and I are tough, we can take it. You're also welcome uh, to raise your hand in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not willing to believe that uh, the uh, exp <coughs> explanation of the use case was uh, so clear and convincing that nobody has any questions, but uh, maybe if you want to uh, uh, think about your questions a little bit more and uh, uh, hold them, we'll uh, collapse the uh, Q&A after uh, the review of the uh, second use case. Uh, does that make sense seeing as people are being a little shy today? Fair enough. All right. So we'll move on. So our second use case uh, by the Verifiable Credentials and Offers team is called, This Is Me and I'm Entitled to a Discount. Um, at, and in this case, a traveler is searching for a hotel in a particular city with specific features. He has several attributes and affiliations that depending on the hotel may entitle him to a discount. He uses a travel app which may be you know, a wallet or, or some user agent sitting on his phone to broadcast his requirements and his verifiable claims to attest to his age and to his affiliations. Hotels then respond with specific offers, each of which reflects the traveler's entitlements. He compares the offers and books the best one. And I think the thing that, that should strike you immediately in this case is that this is a peer-to-peer -peer interaction. So let's meet our traveler. His name is also Bob. This Bob happens to live in suburban Boston. He's planning a business trip to Atlanta. Um, he is 63 years old, which may qualify him for senior rates at some hotel groups. He works for Acme Manufacturing. Uh, he's a member of the AAA Auto Club. And he needs a hotel with a gym near Buckhead on June, 8th, June 15th for two nights. He has no real brand preference. So how does he plan his trip? So this is a diagram of how typical Bob would plan a trip like this today. Um, and at item number one, the hotel on the right, first of all, advises intermediaries, and I'm counting brands as intermediaries here, along with OTAs and travel management companies and, and, and others. The hotel advises them of rates and availabilities. Most of the in these intermediaries usually only get the best available rates or bars. Uh, the brand websites might get the special rates like AAA or senior rates. Uh, at step two, Bob uses a website to see what's available. If he wants to check for senior or AAA rates, he may need to go to the hotel or brand website for each hotel or brand because the OTAs typically don't carry those. His corporate rate might only be bookable through a travel management company. So he's going to need to visit multiple sites in this use case often even multiple hotels on each brand site. At step three, the website requests rates for his criteria, typically from intermediaries. There's an alternative that's indicated with 3A and 4A where Bob goes directly to a hotel property website, but it's not really applicable to this use case, so I'm going to ignore it for this presentation. The intermediary in step four returns a set of rate options to display on the website. Depending on the intermediary, it may also show a, a, you know, a, a set of hotels. Uh, step five, Bob has to visit a lot of websites to find the best rate, maybe an OTA to identify hotels with a gym in the right part of Atlanta, and then brand sites to see which ones have the various discounts, and then maybe a travel management site to see what his corporate rate is. But he, Bob's very thorough. So he checks 10 different hotels individually on their sites, and his TMC site, uh, making note of which ones have senior rates, which ones have AAA rates, which ones have negotiated rates. And after all this work, he chooses one and goes back to the site to book it. 
So let's see instead how this works with self-sovereign identity. We'll start in the lower right where Bob gets verified credentials attesting to his age. That comes from the Massachusetts Driver's License Bureau, his AAA membership, which comes from AAA, and his employment, which comes from ACME. Bob's user agent stores these credentials in his identity hub. The user agent, again, probably just an app on his phone, also collects his hotel requirements, qualifies the hotels, and sends each one of them a message saying what he wants and providing his verifiable credentials. The hotels can respond with offers indicating what they want to sell Bob based on his request and qualifications. One might return a senior rate because that's their best option. Another might return a AAA rate. One might return a corporate rate. One might return a, a best available rate. Some of them might provide multiple offers. For example, if the senior rate is higher than the AAA rate but includes breakfast, it might or might not be a better deal for Bob, depending on whether he has other breakfast plans. So they include both to give him a choice. Bob's user agent, on his phone again probably, filters and orders the offers based on the rules Bob has set and presents them to Bob to choose. Now we included intermediaries here, but they might only be needed for hotels that aren't prepared to respond directly, or if Bob prefers to use one for some reason. Today, many travelers use intermediaries for this use case because they offer more choice across multiple brands, which the brand's websites can't, or can do so only in a very limited way with partners sometimes. With SSI, you don't need intermediaries to get choice. Your user agent can do that for you. And there's room for creativity in the offers. A hotel might see that Bob wants a gym and decide to include a post-workout workout spa treatment as an add-on in one of its responses. So this can be a personalized response if the hotel wants it to be. So why is this a better way? Well, first of all, travelers today cannot create, both create rich requests and shop multiple requires because most intermediaries offer only standard rates and brand sites offer only their own properties. Uh, and even on the brand sites, most can only shop one discount rate at a time and not always across multiple properties. Travel providers have limited or no ability to create dynamic market of one offers. Attributes like a gym are not considered or they don't have accurate data or both. And they often push travelers to intermediaries that may be able to filter across more properties. They can't identify or authenticate specific travelers unless they are logged in to the end provider's site. It's difficult or impossible for travel providers to verify discount eligibility for third-party affiliations or age. They may say, we will check your eligibility at check-in, um, but we, I think we all know that that rarely happens. And this is a source of, of frequent fraud and concern to the hotel brands. There's no ability for the hotels or other travel providers to receive or respond to broadcast requests from qualified customers. So SSI enables peer-to-peer -peer requests and responses or offers between the consumer and the provider, reducing the need for intermediaries. But I think it is important to note that SSI can operate in parallel with existing distribution mechanisms. This is not an either or. People are still going to be using brand websites, people are still going to be using OTAs, but as people start to get user agents that become more and more capable, more and more of them may start sending these requests. So let's talk a little bit about the key assumptions and dependencies. This is all new stuff. What needs to change to make it possible? So Bob and the travel providers both need to have the necessary self-sovereign identity capabilities. So Again, referring back to Nick's presentation from three weeks ago, DIDs, user agents, identity hubs, uh, the ability to support peer-to-peer -peer communications. This doesn't happen until they do. Third parties have to be able to issue verifiable credentials. This is starting to happen today, uh, and we think it will certainly grow over time, but it is still a requirement for this to work. Travel providers are gonna to need to be able to respond to a specific request from Bob with an appropriate offer. 
Now that may be a canned offer. It may be a very personalized offer. That's up to them. Bob is gonna to have to have an app that can filter and sort the offers based on his preferences. And the offers um, are either gonna to have to expire maybe after 15 minutes as, as is common in websites today, or they may be conditional and stored um, so that they can be recalled at a later point and the conditions are pre-verified. So obviously this isn't all going to happen overnight. And a lot of it may not even start in the travel industry. There's a lot of things going on in finance and banking, healthcare, and with governments that may help to meet some of these prerequisites. And to be sure, there are companies working on some of these now, and we have a lot of interest in pursuing some of the others once we have a little bit more of the technical groundwork laid. So let's talk about the benefits. Well, so for the consumer, this puts the consumer at the center of the transaction. Now the consumer can tell each travel provider exactly what they want and who they are and share the information that they think is relevant to get the best possible offer. They can, they can uh, get more targeted and more relevant offers as a result. They determine what of their PII is disclosed. So if they think that disclosing a particular piece of information will help them get a better uh, offer, a more relevant offer, uh, then they may choose to do that or they may choose to withhold it if they think uh, there's no advantage to it. And, and their desired hotel attributes can be guaranteed. And we haven't really talked about the mechanism for that, but that's one of the other things that could be done with this. For the travel provider, uh, first of all, they get current and accurate customer information at all times. If you've ever looked at the, what's behind the scenes in a uh, loyalty database, the data is often woefully out of date. Uh, and yet the, it's the only thing the hotels have, so they use it. This gets past that and makes sure that they have up-to-date information. It supports flexible quotes that are tailored per customer. It can target the responses to customers who are the best fit for their product. So they can choose one customers that are requesting things or have attributes that they think are perfect fits for their profit, their, their product, and, uh, and, and make sure that they deliver something that's really relevant to them and maybe give everybody else just a vanilla response. It also reduces the need for intermediaries. And certainly if you've, if you've followed the hotel industry for the last 20 years, you know that that's been, been a big uh, issue for uh, the brands and hotels. So what could prevent this from happening? You know, there, there's a lot of things that, um, the, you know, are barriers to uh, adoption of things like this, but we've tried to identify the ones that are probably the most important. One would be travel providers not adopting it because they don't understand the benefits of not storing customer data centrally. For many, many years, the mantra has been get as much data as you can about the customer and build a big uh, data warehouse. Never mind that it's usually not very accurate uh, and certainly doesn't reflect everything about the customer, it more reflects the things that the customer has told them because they asked or reflects actual past business uh, trips or, or whatever that uh, have resulted in revenue for the hotel company. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, we do, we do expect there's an education that's going to need to happen to the travel providers to get away from the idea of we have to store everything and into the idea of we can get it from the customer when we need it and it'll be more accurate. Second thing is fragmented hotel stack and vendors needing to adapt to pull customer data from identity hubs. Um, you know, we, we have a difficult hotel, uh, tech stack in the hotel industry. And you know, this is not gonna be the simplest thing to get past, but we're you know, very pleased to see a number of vendors who are very involved in this effort, who think that this is important to, to prioritize and hopefully they will, they will be the, the pioneers. And there's also a, a, you know, a, a network of trust to develop, verify eligibility. A uh, you know, perfect example is the driver's license um, as, a, as a proof of age. How does the hotel know who is a legitimate issuer of a driver's license? Well, those things are being worked on for industries 
you know, outside of hospitality. Uh, there's some things that are going on within the travel industry as well. Uh, but that network of trust needs to be created so that there is a, a way to determine that this has been issued by somebody that I should trust. It's a real driver's license bureau. It's not somebody who just stood up their own. So those are some of the barriers. What are some of the enablers? What could cause this to happen sooner? Um, one is uh, pilots from hotel companies or, or even some, in some cases, perhaps some of the, the uh, technology providers that operate in tandem with existing distribution approaches so that they can book a, a, an SSI type of a reservation while still handling uh, the, the basic kind. And we've had some discussions about how that could be done relatively easily, but obviously it has to be done. Um, new, we think that so there are some newer hotel companies that have modern tech stacks and they are targeting younger digitally equipped consumers that could maybe be ones that could lead the way with this kind of thing. One thing that could cause this to happen sooner um, is kind of one of, one of the silver linings of, of COVID pandemic is digital health credentials because they are needed now in some cases to meet national or reg regional testing requirements. Um, certainly for international air travel, it's quite common. And in some cases you need them to get into hotels and restaurants depending on the country. This would create the infrastructure for some of the verified credentials uh, to be passed around uh, sooner. And that's already starting to happen. Uh, pilots addressing use cases that are poorly served today. And I think Bob's was a perfect, bad, poorly served use case uh, in today's environment. Um, we think that there could be some entry of uh, self-sovereign identity, decentralized digital ID practitioners from other industries that uh, have done some things, maybe in banking or finance or healthcare, and see some opportunity to bring it into travel and hospitality. And I think the other um, thing that could cause it to happen sooner is PII regulations. Um, the, the risk of breach, the cost of breaches, the attractiveness of potentially not having to store a lot of sensitive information, but getting it on demand when needed. So all of these are things that could cause this to happen sooner. So with that, that concludes um, our second use case. And uh, again, we'll open it up and see if there's any questions. And I see that uh, Jean has posted, posted a question in the chat. Um, see, are there any proof of concepts in DID that, that in place that touch the hospitality and, and uh, travel space? Um, Nick, maybe you wanna take this in terms of what IATA has been doing. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, IATA has uh, a keen interest in uh, SSI and decentralized digital ID for a very uh, clear reason, because it wants to uh, get international air travel underway again. And um, health passes are foundational to that effort. So IATA has um, been, <coughs> been one of a number of organizations work, working in this area right now. Um, they have partnered with a company called Evanim. Um, they're working um, with a consortium or with a number of IATA members, airline members, who are piloting a, uh, a fully uh, SSI capable decentralized digital ID um, travel pass called the IATA travel pass. And uh, it is currently in beta test across a number of airlines. Uh, and I expect it will be very shortly in um, initial release if it isn't already. And the company that uh, pr provides the foundational uh, technologies underneath it is a company out of Scotland called Evernim, E-V-E-R-N-Y-M. And they have been very active in DIFF and, and have, have uh, uh, helped us with some of the things that we've been working on as well. Yes, indeed. And if anybody is interested, a quick shout out, Evanim has a hospitality and travel um, presentation tomorrow, which uh, uh, some of you may want to watch. Yeah, and there's another tremendously exciting uh, pilot uh, out there that uh, is worth being aware of. It's actually uh, sponsored by the German federal government. 
<clears throat> we're told that uh, it has Angela Merkel's uh, personal attention, and they've actually had to change several laws to make it work. <clears throat> the uh, first use case uh, that they're piloting is hotel check-in. <clears throat> it's contained, it's limited to uh, uh, three uh, brands of uh, uh, hotels, Steigenberger, uh, Motel One, and uh, forgive me, I don't recall the third. Linder. 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 Uh, I believe it's 200-some uh, properties uh, across uh, uh, Germany. Uh, there's uh, half a dozen or so large German companies with many business travelers participating. Uh, I seem to recall 200,000 potential uh, uh, travelers uh, participating. And it's a real live uh, example of uh, using uh, uh, decentralized digital identity to prove who you are, to prove your affiliation uh, 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 with your employer, and to qualify to get a, a key at uh, check-in. And it's been live in the wild, uh, I believe, since May. If you uh, go to the uh, directory of uh, uh, recorded uh, uh, Zoom presentations uh, uh, for uh, DIFF, uh, uh, we do have a recording uh, from the uh, of a presentation on uh, this pilot from the CIO of uh, Deutsche Hospitality uh, uh, in there, and it's just, uh, well worth seeing uh, what they've done to bring this to life in a contained pilot uh, uh, beta test mode. Unfortunately, we weren't able to record that one because of some oh, that's right. sensitivity. That's right. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> False promise there. Yeah, but unfortunately, it was, it was a great yeah, presentation, yeah. but uh, yeah. hopefully we'll be able to get, get one on the record at some point, maybe when it's a little less sensitive. It was the very first, uh, uh, they, there were seven different uh, industries that were uh, identified for pilots, and this is the first, first of the seven to launch in, in, in hospitality, so uh, got a lot of visibility. In fact, one of the senior German um, cabinet ministers was the first person to use it. So do we have other questions? We've got a yes, few more minutes. We so. do, We do, Doug. Uh, one, um, we have a, a, a new joiner, for, uh, Al Gilbert, um, and he actually sent it to me directly. So I will, I'll read it out. Um, is, what is the security risk? If an outside gets the SSI identity, they have the keys to my kingdom. And that's a really, really, really good question and a very common perception, which is, has a very, very uh, credible answer and counter. Um, would you like to take it, Doug, or would you like me to do that? Why, why don't you take it, Nick? Okay, so the, the fundamental concept of a decentralized digital identity or an identifier is that it's cryptographically provable to be you. It's unique and it's cryptographically provable. So um, to cut uh, uh, a, a lot of the detail out of it, um, essentially the interaction, which is a cryptographically, cryptographic challenge response is um, a public key that I have issued and is associated with my decentralized identifier is available for look up via the decentralized uh, decentralized framework. Um, and when I presented a decentra decentralized uh, digital ID and identifier, it did, um, that did is used to look up that public key. That public key and that did is then available as a challenge to me and I can issue my I issue my private key to sign that interaction. So basically you have a private and a public key match, which proves that the decentralized identifier is actually me and it hasn't and cannot be uh, copied or used by anybody else. And just to elaborate on that, uh, 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 this cryptographic technology is uh, very well known and mature and understood. It's called Decentralized Public Key Infrastructure. Uh, it goes by the acronym DPKI. And if you just uh, Google DPKI, you'll find out much more about it than you ever wanted to know. Okay, but what happens if somebody obtains your private key for, for whatever? Nefarious. Yeah, good. Very, very good question. Well, your your private—that's the question of where your private key is. 
they don't have access to your private key. Your private key is typically stored um, uh, under a, some so, so on, on something that's private to you. So it's stored within your your identity wallet, which is private to you. And access to that identity wallet would uh, typically be um, governed by a biometric that's associated with you. So similar to the way uh, you know a payment on say Apple or Google Pay work today. Yeah, yeah. So the did the did is public. The did enables um, the receiving party to uh, find your public key. With that public key, they issue a challenge, uh, and from my wallet, uh, I use a bio biometric authentication to issue a private key to sign that challenge, sign that uh, challenge. And that's essentially how uh, this decentralized public key infrastructure supports uh, the interaction. Yeah, think of uh, uh, something analogous to Apple's uh, uh, Face ID uh, application as the biometric means of securing your wallet. Yeah, and then we could go down a rabbit hole of what happens if you lose your, your phone and where it actually is the key. And that's a whole different discussion about key recovery, um, but maybe too deep for this. But essentially, uh, it, it is private to you. And um, the interactions that we're talking about here are automatic. They're automated. If your identical twin steals your phone, there is an issue, but, but there's an issue today if your identical twin shows up with your passport. So it's not really no different. Yeah, but we're accepting a system where Apple has our biometric information as a centralized entity. No, no, we're not. No, 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 we're not. We, we don't imply that this is, this is not nothing to do with Apple. Yeah. So the... Go ahead. And, Apple's biometrics, Face ID, and in the earlier models of phones, uh, the fingerprints, uh, <clears throat> uh, those are not centralized. Uh, those are stored in a chip on your phone. Okay. Okay, we're here to ask questions. Yeah, yeah. We have other and questions. you'll see in the chat, uh, James uh, uh, noted that the biometrics are stored locally. Any further elaborated yeah. that Apple has no visibility to uh, those that's in a secure region on a specific chip? Okay, cool. Hey guys, uh, Josh from Wyndham. Um, pleasure to be here for the, for the next round of these webinars. Um, I wanted to, to dive in a little bit more and I was hoping that, uh, that in one of the use cases today it would come up and you touched on it, but on the distribution side of things, right? We talked about associating your, your IDs and your credentials and your preferences and all of those good things in your, in, you know, your did, how do you envision that shopping process happening, right? Because there's a conversation around all of the providers being able to return rates, but is there any, like, is that solution today? How those, how those requests for information would get out there and who determines who responds to those requests, right? Like how, how is that domain or categorization of I'm a hotel or I'm an Airbnb or I'm a, you know, like, I'm just, I guess I'm struggling a little bit with the distribution and, and maybe it's still just conceptual at this point and that's why I'm struggling with it, but I'm interested okay. in your perspective on how you would envision that happening. I'll, I'll take that one. Um, it is conceptual at this point. I think we, we have a vision of how it might work uh, and it may or may not be the way that it comes to pass, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you my overview of the vision. Um, I would think that probably the intelligence about how to, how to select hotels that might be of interest would be in the user agent or, or perhaps an application that uh, is, is referenced by the user agent. So finding which, which hotels in Buckhead uh, would be potential candidates for our Bob to, um, uh, to look at would be within the domain of the user agent. Um, the user agent would then send the messages out to the hotels um, based on uh, knowing where they are and where their, where their service endpoints are for that, uh, which they can, would be able to get from their DIDs if they are participating or potentially from the DID of an intermediary if they were uh, using a, a service bureau or somebody. Each hotel through its own logic would decide how to respond and would create one or more offers that would then go back to the user agent on Bob's phone. 
and the user agent would know Bob's rules for um, how to sort them and how to filter them. So if, if they got 20 or 30 different offers from different hotels, um, it might say the only thing Bob cares about is rates, so we're gonna show lowest rate first. Or it might say, uh, Bob you know, prefers things that include breakfast. Um, and, and therefore the ones that include breakfast get shown first. So the intelligence that relates to what Bob wants and how he evaluates it sits on the um, user agent side or something that the user agent is using, uh, you know, perhaps a, a third party service uh, to, to help with it. The intelligence about how to respond uh, is in the hotel reservation system or, or some module that perhaps is certainly in the early days, it's, it's probably not in the core reservation system. It's probably a, a, an external module that consults the rates and availability and uh, decides how to construct a response. Uh, and, and certainly there'll be a learning period over some period of time as hotels start to get these requests as they filter, figure out how to optimize their responses. But it is conceptual um, right now. Yeah, it makes sense. I guess I, I'm, uh, and I'm, you know, appreciate the insight there. I think I'm, I'm with you on that part. I guess I'm wondering about the cataloging of all of those assets though, right? Like how do I even identify like, what's the search mechanism that allows me to say I'm looking for hotels in Buckhead? Like, there, there's going to have to be an underlying service provider, I feel like, that is going to maintain that catalog, right? Like a GDS or a CRS or any other consolidated system does today. And I, and I guess uh, that would be kind of outside the scope of, of the, the DIDS function in this case, right? I, I, I guess I'm just... Um, yeah, wondering I mean, about it, how that how that mechanism would be constructed to be able to search amongst inventory without passing off control of that to, to again, some other intermediary, right? Like it feels like you're still yep. going to need an OTA or somebody in the middle to broker that, please list my hotel using these artifacts in this, in this mm -hmm. uh, function. Yeah, you don't totally get away from intermediaries, but you may end up significantly reducing their scope. Um, and we've talked a little bit about this issue um, in terms of you know, the hotels can, can put some of this information in their identity hub and there could even be third parties that verify it. Uh, so for example, if you want to claim uh, that you have a gym uh, and if there is some national association of, of, uh, of gyms that, that will certify that you really do have a gym, that could go into your identity hub there's still going to need to be someplace, a list of, of bids of travel providers that might meet a general um, requirement. Like, you know, what are all the hotels in Georgia or all the hotels in the US or all the hotels in the world? Um, and, and yes, there could be an intermediary of some sort. There, there's a concept that we've discussed in a number of, of these use cases around trust registries. Uh, which is, you know, a lot of these things need somebody to say, who can you trust? And this, this is kind of a logical application for a, a trust agency to say, this did belongs to a real hotel. And maybe there's some very basic information uh, about the hotel, like, you know, it's, it's geolocation or something like that, uh, th that is included there. But it's a much more limited role than intermediaries play today. Um, you know, and and that's, that's really probably all that's needed. If you, if you know that somebody is a hotel and you can find the hotels that are in a particular geographic area, then you're off and running. Uh, but yeah, that is, it, it is a barrier and, and you probably do need some sort of a trust intermediary to provide that. Great, no, it makes sense. Thanks, I appreciate the additional context. So we're coming up to the top of the hour here. Um, if we probably have time for one last question, if there are any. Or if not, uh, we will thank you all for your participation. We do are planning, don't have a date yet set, but we are planning another webinar for two additional use cases that are nearing completion now. Uh, so that'll be in coming weeks. Uh, so keep, Keep tuned to your email for invitations. And uh, for those who want to share this, we will get the recording out 
post it on YouTube and send the link out probably within the next uh, 24 to 48 hours. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, for, uh, for your, your work on, on uh, your use case. Nick, thanks for your leadership in this group and thanks everybody for joining us today. Thank you all.